Coming up on Business Incorporated. <music> Telecom giant MTN to sell about 101 billion naira stake in Nigeria. <music> and top cashew producer Ivory Coast set to triple production. Egypt's BMI falls in October as global supply chain bottlenecks way. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Ladi Williams. Uh, first, uh, let's uh, look at the markets. Uh, major markets in the African continent are in intraday were uh, mostly mixed. In Nigeria, the all share index saw marginal, uh, uh, marginal loss of 0.04%, while uh, South Africa's GSC all share index was up by 0.04%. 1.6% at intraday. Still on continent, Egypt was in the red, down by 1.50%. Kenya closed Wednesday's trading session up uh, by 0.11%. Over in the Middle East, the investor sentiment were also mixed at intraday. Abu Dhabi was up 0.61%. Uh, Our Dubai's index slipped by 0.05%. In other parts, Saudi Arabia's uh, Tadal share dropped by 0.10%, while Qatar's index added 0.46%. And uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve said that Wednesday it will begin to curb the pace of its monthly bond buying program later this month. Well, how are the European uh, markets uh, reacting to this? Let's cross over now to Frankfurt with Chelsea Delaney. Uh, great to have you, Chelsea. Well, following the U.S. Federal Reserve's uh, meeting the European Central Bank President, Christine Lagarde, has given an update on her expectations for you know, policy tightening in the EU. Uh, what does she have to say? So we did hear from President Lagarde yesterday, who was speaking in Lisbon, that she doesn't think that uh, we're really anywhere close to the time to raise interest rates. So what she said is that we have three conditions for raising interest rates. And at this point, uh, these three conditions are very unlikely to be satisfied by the end of next year. So she's really pushing back against some of the market expectations we've seen over the past couple of weeks that maybe the European Central Bank could, could raise interest rates by the end of next year. She's saying, that actually if, if you look at the longer term inflation outlook, if you look at the longer term economic outlook, uh, we're really not uh, close to that point to need an interest rate increase. So this puts the ECB uh, pretty far behind many other central banks in the world. We heard yesterday from the Fed that they are going to move cautiously, but investors do think the Fed will start to raise rates uh, potentially by the middle of next year. The Bank of England could potentially raise them today. So uh, the ECB, the European um, central bank is probably going to be the laggard uh, among developed markets to, to raise interest rates. And I would note that that's quite good news for investors here uh, in Europe, which are very dependent on this easy money policies from the ECB, from the Fed. Today, we do have the DAX uh, hitting a new record high here in Frankfurt. All right, I'll be getting the BOE uh, outcome in a moment. Meanwhile, the German economy has, you know, finally gotten some, some good news. Factory orders uh, rebounded in September. What drove that? Yeah, after really uh, weeks and weeks of nothing but business declines, we do finally get some some upbeat news, especially for the manufacturing sector, which has been hit really hard by the supply chain bottlenecks. Um, we saw new data showing that new factory orders were up 1.3 percent uh, in September. That's after they fell about 9 percent the previous month, so quite a big turnaround. Um, what this data shows is that there still is a strong demand for European goods, um, excuse me, for German goods abroad. So domestic demand is very weak, but we did see quite a bounce back in demand um, from particularly China, from Asia, uh, from, from places like the United States. Uh, what people are buying is, is really man, uh, machinery and equipment that was up about 12% um, in that month. And we also saw a, a big increase in, um, in demand and orders for vehicles, which uh, has also been hit by the supply chain um, disruption. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the manufacturing sector has solved these uh, supply chain issues, but it, it is an indication that there is still demand for, uh, for German goods once the, these issues uh, are resolved. Right, there's still a demand there. Well, uh, Credit Suisse 
back in the news again. They've announced uh, they will restructure uh, operations after a series of scandals that have uh, uh, hit uh, profits. What is the plan? Uh, so Credit Suisse is, is unveiling a pretty wide restructuring effort today, and this comes after they've been embroiled in several major financial scandals this year. Uh, you may remember the Archegos a hedge fund implosion earlier this year. This was an American hedge fund that um, Credit Suisse was uh, basically helping to trade stocks that firm imploded, and, and Credit Suisse ended up losing about $5 billion on it. So in the wake of that, uh, they are trying to cut down risk at their business. So they they say they will exit prime brokerage uh, almost entirely. They also plan to uh, do some consolidation in their wealth management division. And really, their their main goal is to get back to the main business of Credit Suisse, which is you know serving the very wealthy uh, of the world. Uh, that being said, they still do have a lot of challenges ahead of them. They're facing you know a lot of lawsuits from investors. They're facing a lot of regulatory investigations. So uh, this isn't really going to do much much to, to move Credit Suisse beyond these uh, this scandal-ridden uh, past couple of months. All right, uh, Chelsea, thanks uh, for the update. Uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right, uh, over to England now. It's uh, all about the Bank of England uh, meeting today. Let's uh, cross over to Juliana now for uh, update. Great to have you, Juliana. So uh, I'm, I'm guessing the meeting is, uh, the session is out now. W what is it? Yeah, the decision is out, uh, Laddie. Good afternoon. The Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee have agreed um, in an ununanimous um, vote to keep interest rates on hold at 0.1%. I think this time last week, all economists expected um, this decision uh, to be the outcome. But I suppose um, there was a little bit of angst um, following last night's decision um, by the Federal Reserve to start tapering down um, bond purchases in the US. Bond purchasing in the UK will also remain the same. I believe it's currently at about £895 billion. Now, interest rates rising is still very much on the agenda. Potentially, it could be at next month's gathering on the 16th of December or in the new year. Um, we know that uh, inflation is currently running well above what the Bank of England target is, which is uh, 2%. It's currently at about 3.1%. And in uh, the notes which are being scrutinised um, right about now, I believe um, the Bank of England governor has said that um, inflation could rise as high as 5%. And the only way you can curb inflation is to cut interest rates. So it hasn't happened now but it's certainly expected soon all right we'll be watching that but how are the markets uh, reacting at intraday well, yes, both um, the, the, the markets, um, the FTSE All Share, the FTSE 100 and FTSE 250 all rose uh, following the announcement by the Bank of England. We also got a rise in the pound currently trading high against the US dollar, the euro and the Japanese yen. All right, and uh, UK car sales are... Uh hit uh, 30 year low uh, last month. I guess it's still the global uh, supply chain crisis there. Eh? Yeah, it is. It's a couple of things, really, um, Laddie. It's the the semiconductor shortages. We know a number of car plants up and down uh, Britain have had to halt a production because of the semiconductor chip shortages. It's not just affecting UK car manufacturers. It's affecting car manufacturers across the world. Toyota, Japan's biggest automaker, um, released their updates um, early this morning. And even though they've got bumper profits, they did say that uh, the shortage is really a denting production. So that's one thing and then of course the other thing is COVID it's still very very sluggish uh, people not really uh, willing to go into their back pocket to, to, to buy a new car a lot of people are buying second hand cars interestingly though as we are still um, uh, watching what's happening up in Glasgow the COP26 summit um, electric vehicles they are starting to really show uh, their growth in the car market uh, production um, in the UK I believe it's risen to about 15% during the month 
month of November, the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders predict that by the end of the year, um, the electric vehicle market will be about 25%, which is um, really good. We know that the British government has started to unveil new incentives to try and get people uh, to go away from their 4x4 guzzlers and get themselves an electric vehicle. So good news on one front, uh, but bad news in another in that uh, the car production industry in the UK is still being hampered. All right. All right, Juliana. Thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on to uh, Asia now. Uh, shares in Asia Pacific uh, rose today following the U.S. Federal Reserve's announcement that it will start tapering the pace of its bond purchases uh, later in November. The Nikkei 225 in Japan closed at 0.93% higher, 29,794 points, while the Topics Index advanced 1.18% to 2,055 points. South Korea's Kospi also climbed 0.25% on the day to uh, 2,983 points. In mainland China, the Shanghai Composite finished the trading day 0.81% higher, about 3,526 points, while the Shenzhen component jumped 1.3% to 14,555 points. Hong Kong's uh, Hang Seng Index was up around 0.4% as of its final hour of trading. Australian stocks rose in trade as the S&P ASX 200 gained 0.48%, closing at 7,428. MSCI's broadest index of Asia-Pacific shares outside Japan climbed 0.31%. And U.S. stock index futures were steady during early morning trading after the major averages closed at records uh, following commentary from the Federal Reserve. The central bank said uh, it will begin the slow uh, pace of buying, uh, bond buying program, signaling that the economy can now handle an unwinding of a pandemic uh, stimulus. Futures contracts tied to the Dow Jones Industrial Average were just four points lower. S&P 500 futures and NASDAQ 100 futures hovered uh, in positive territory. Buying will slow uh, by about $15 billion per month, which means the quantitative easing should end by the middle of 2022. Though the Fed reiterated flexibility, saying the amount uh, could change if warranted. And oil prices extended uh, declines today, pushing uh, U.S. Uh, futures below the $80 uh, mark up a barrel after Iran and the world uh, powers agreed to resume nuclear talks this month that could lead to the removal of U.S. sanctions on Iranian oil, increasing global supplies. U.S. Texas intermediate uh, crude futures slid uh, for a third day to $79.94 a barrel. That's uh, below the $80 mark. Uh, Brent crude futures for uh, January fell for a second session to $81.19 a barrel. That's down about $0.80. Cents. Both benchmarks yesterday posted their biggest daily percentage decline since early August, with Brent closing at its lowest since October 7th, and WTI since uh, October 13th, after weekly inventory data from the U.S. Energy Information uh, Administration showed a larger-than-expected rise in our crude stocks last week. And gold prices bounced back from a three-week low as the dollar weakened after the U.S. Federal Reserve approved plans to unwind its stimulus program this month while retaining low interest rates uh, for some time. Spot gold was up 0.3%, $1,774 per ounce of uh, early trade after touching its lowest since October 13th uh, in the previous session. U.S. gold futures rose 0.7% to $1,776. The dollar index uh, slipped 0.2% overnight, was uh, trading a little, uh, little, little change at 93 uh, in uh, early Asia trading. Spot silver edge 0.1% higher to $23.52 per ounce. Platinum gained 0.7% to $1,036, while palladium climbed 0.6% uh, to $2,012. And after the break, commodities market updates its next. That's in a moment. So stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching Business Incorporated live on Channel Television. Now to our commodities market update. Well, at the COP26 climate change summit, it's all about the trend towards a zero carbon board. And the world's 12th largest carbon emitter is currently faced with the a prospect of the commissioning uh, of a 22 gigawatts of coal power of its largest electricity uh, generating plants, ESCOM, and investing it in uh, renewable uh, 
power capacity. Well, let's uh, have this conversation now with uh, Maiwa Ige, an analyst at Financial uh, Derivatives uh, Company. Great to have you, Maiwa. Hello, great to, see, great to be here this afternoon. All right, so we've seen, you know, developed nations uh, such as UK, US, and France uh, have also announced that they would sign a just uh, energy transition uh, partnership at COP26 to help South Africa phase out uh, coal. What is the reason for this move, and what would this shift, you know, mean uh, from uh, fossil fuels like uh, coal to renewable energy mean for OPEC and oil producing countries? Well, um, climate change has been causing extreme weather in different parts of the world. I mean, and everyone is feeling it. This year alone, we've seen floods in parts of Europe, in China. We've seen Hurricane Ida in the U.S. And then we've also seen um, droughts in areas like Canada, Brazil. And even the drought has led to has affected agricultural production and led to supply shortages, which has led to the um, price, in, the hike in commodity prices globally. And Nigeria also hasn't been ex exempted from this from this climate change. This year, we had the extreme flooding in in uh, July in Lagos, where cars were submerged in water. But last year, again, we also had um, floods wipe out about 25 percent of our rice harvest. Right, our rice harvest. So we can see that this climate change is not an environmental issue alone, and it's not um, peculiar to only one country. It's it's an issue that affects the economic and social stability of the world. Now, coal is a is is um, a major is a fossil is one of the major contributors to um, climate change and all, coal, the the burning of coal releases greenhouse emission gases which contributes a lot a lot to climate change. Coal, coal burning is about seventy two percent of um elect or from electric coal burning is contributes about seventy two percent from the electricity sector and so this radically explains the move. Of, of the developed nations and South Africa. As regards to OPEC, with the transition to, to renewable energy and then the less, less dependence on oil, we'll see a decline in the relevance and then the power of OPEC. And for all producing, all, all producing nations, it would also affect their economic stability, right? But then we're also seeing forward-thinking countries like um, Saudi Arabia, who have started investing in building solar and wind um, projects with the aim of being the most reliable energy supply in the world. All right, and obviously Nigeria will be, you know, affected uh, uh, by this. How do you, it, this is obviously a threat to, you know, Nigeria, and uh, how would this, you know, change our long-term economic uh, prospects going forward? Um, well, it goes without saying that it would affect our economic stability. When you consider that crude oil is a major, is contributes a major um, revenue source and also a source of foreign exchange and also the fact that our budget is based on the assumption of um, price of oil per barrel and oil production right so we can see that it would have a very large impact on our on our economy and also the ripple effect of all of that is that we would see a weak in naira higher inflation we see increased debt burden debt burden and also a slow a slow growth and possible recession so but, but I would say that it's not all doom and gloom, right? This transition is not something that will happen immediately. There's still a bit of time before the world completely transitions to renewable energy. So we have to be more intentional about diversifying our economy now, right? And we, I would say that we should also not concentrate only on the agricultural sector. There's, there are other sectors we could explore. For instance, we could actually explore, explore the renewable energy space in itself with the, with the transition to renewable energy there's been an increase in growing demand for lithium materials such as lithium and other materials like manganese, aluminum, graphite, which Nigeria actually has a sizable deposit, deposit of in our country. And so we should concentrate on the mining sector, um, addressing, improving that sector, addressing the challenges that mining companies face in that sector. I guess it's uh, time to look for the uh, new oil. Well, at the COP26, the uh, president, Nigeria's president, uh, Mamdou Bari announced the country's plan to achieve uh, net zero emission by 2060 through its energy transition program. You know, Nigeria is heavily reliant on uh, gas, hydro, and thermal energy plants. Is this uh, time frame, you know, actually realistic? And what are the implications of this? Well, on that one, the UN actually has a target of 2050. So Nigeria's 2060 is just 10 years. There's just a 10 year Just 10 difference. years, and right. Maybe, <laughs> just 10 years. So maybe we can say that 
it's it's not unrealistic. But however, that's about 39 years. That's a long time from now. I think that we should be more focused on the how, right? How will this plan be implemented? We need to look at what are the causes of greenhouse emission gases in Nigeria, right? We need to also know what infrastructures do we need to put in place right, to curb these emissions. Right? So I think our focus should be more on, on those kind of things. Yes, we know that in Nigeria, our power plant is hydropowered, right? But looking at the poor state of the elect electric electricity sector, right, a lot of Nigerians rely on fossil-powered generators. So we still have a lot of greenhouse emissions. So we need to improve that sector. Also, I say that it's more important that we should to not rely on other countries to help us out of this situation. We need to look inward and see how we can do this for ourselves. But the implication on this with us is we are going to need increased funding, financing, to be able to right. put the right in, in infrastructure in place to transition to renewable energy. Right. I guess it's time to look at inward. Anyway, Maya, well, always great to talk to you. Maya Waiga is an analyst at Financial uh, Derivatives Company. Enjoy the rest of your day. Meanwhile, South African telecommunications giant MTN plans to sell shares in the carrier as Nigeria unit worth about 101 billion naira and continuing a plan to dispose of assets and pay down debt. Statement from the Johannesburg based company says Africa's largest mobile phone op operator will offer 575 million shares in MTN Nigeria and a broader plan to sell about 14% parent company's holdings in its largest and most profitable unit. Sale of its uh, Nigerian unit comes as MTN looks to uh, finalize a sale and lease uh, back of its uh, South African telecom mass portfolio and list shares in the Uganda operations in Kampala. And uh, South Africa's average house, uh, household food basket increased by 98, uh, 98 uh, rand and 80, 80 cents. Uh, month and month, and 400 rand and 83 cents uh, year on year. In October 2021, the average household food basket costs uh, 4,317 uh, rand. There have been higher increases in vegetable prices due to seasonal changes uh, of that of milk, eggs, uh, meat, and bread. Rising food prices will continue to put severe pressure on households uh, whose uh, income remained low through uh, low baseline wages, low-level social grants, and the total basket is well beyond the affordability threshold of families living on low incomes. The national minimum wage for this uh, same period at 336, 343 rand and 92 cents. And top cashew producer Ivory Coast is to open three new processing plants with the aim of uh, tripling its output of shelled nuts by next year. The African country last year produced a record 1 million tons of nuts, uh, up from 850,000 tons in 2019, but just 10% uh, have so far been uh, processed domestically. Ivory Coast aims to process more of its uh, own crop for sale in the huge American uh, market. Until now, most of the nuts have been shelled abroad and shipped to the U.S. at an exorbitant cost. Ivory Coast, which uh, counts some 250,000 cashew nut producers, uh, organized into around 20 uh, cooperatives ultimately hopes to shelf, uh, shell half of its uh, cashew nut by 2025. And Nigerian deposit money banks have set December 31st this year as a deadline, accepting the current 20 and 50 pound notes for a proper conclusion of a cash evacuation. This comes as the Bank of England has announced that it would withdraw uh, the currency notes after September 30th, 2022, while providing a year's notice to its customers and the global banking community. In August this year, the BOE chief uh, cashier, uh, cashier uh, Sarah John, said that the bank had began uh, the circulation of new polymer 50 pound notes, which contains uh, advanced security features of the paper 20 and 50 pounds uh, will be withdrawn. And that's it on Business Incorporated. Thank you for watching. I'm Ladi Williams. Bye for now.